Okay, um, I'm a, a Mohawk uh, from Six Nations, and I looked at uh, representations of indigenous people, mainly in the Americas. So going through McMaster, going through my, my undergrad, grad, I found that I wasn't learning anything. I had to go out and do original research as an undergrad to find things that I understood would speak to me other than the only thing we ever did was uh, make bow and arrows and have pottery. And that's pretty much the extent of who we were or how we were represented. Um, so Burkhofer, uh-oh. Burkhofer is, it's not working. A historian who wrote a book called *The White Man's Indian*, and um, it was back in the 80s. But essentially, he talks about how. Can somebody help me? Um, how indigenous people were represented by Western institutions, um, mainly in different genres. So Hollywood being number one, and then you had to go on to. Um, um, the ideas of, of being a primitive. And at that point, um, that idea hasn't changed much. So you're talking about creativity, thinking. It's like, where does your understanding of thinking about indigenous people come from? It comes from education, it comes from media. Um, all those representations and research on indigenous people essentially doesn't come from us. Um, it comes from the ideas and psyche of Europeans who came to the Americas, oh, I see it's working on here, um, and essentially started to dominate the story, the narrative. And at this time, by looking at indigenous people, they really were projecting themselves, and it really had nothing to do with indigenous people. Um, and if you look at the Hollywood genre, 2,000 films, all of them dehumanize indigenous people. They construct the image of a savage um, who killed innocent people um, who were backwards. And then Berger, who is a, a, um, a justice who did the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, he looked at the discourses going back to um, the debate in Spain in 1550. And it was between Las Casas and Spavolda. And the two of them argued as to whether indigenous people were human or not human. And essentially, Berger argues that that same narrative and discourse continues on to this very day. Um, and this is grounded in a lot of um, mythologies about indigenous people. So at the end of the day, um, his conclusion in his work um, was that nothing has really changed. Um, the idea is that in order, um, the Pope ruled that we were human um, and, and went with Las Casas. And, but he said only if we become Christian. So only if we become in the image of the oppressor can we be human. And thus began the idea of um, this narrative on our ways and our ideas and the things that we have done uh, contributed to the world was gonna be represented to the world by the colonizer. And this dominant system of representation for, was really issues of American or Canadian identities, their idea of diversity, and their idea of sovereignty. And they had to, at some um, level, um, talk about you know, whether or not we had a spirituality of ourselves, and it was called barbaric and so forth, um, and all of this is wrapped up in race, ethnicity, class, gender today, um, and that the reconfiguration of who we are because our ideas and our thinking comes from our spirituality. That is the basis of how we know who we are and our identity and our sovereignty comes from the creator. It's an inherent right that we have. So this is in direct contrast to um, European representation, um, their myth of the Indian. And the idea was that, um, you know, they were appropriating our knowledges, they were appropriating our medicines, 
our land. They were colonizing um, all the things that we had contributed to their survival in the Americas, but they never gave any credit to the people um, who gave them that knowledge, and that was Indigenous people. So everything from irrigation to foods to political thought, we have shaped the psyche and the ideas of the West. And that's what you won't, and I'm sure you haven't learned at any level of education, you know, from kindergarten on. So that's the sad part, and that's kind of the evidence, is that people don't have any idea of how much Indigenous people have contributed to the world. One is just democracy. The Iroquois people, as you know them, we call ourselves Haudenosaunee, um, met with Franklin in Pennsylvania in the 1700s and unfortunately gave them our political philosophy about unity and the bows and the arrows being bound together, which is still the American symbol. Um, Franklin then wrote an article and talked, if the Iroquois can become a union, a sovereign union, then certainly, you know, these savages who are able to have two levels of government, one is the, the federal, one, of, one is the state, we called them different things, and the, the power invested was the people. And we gave them that information, which is well documented in a number of articles. Um, essentially, that was our undoing because they followed that, and at the end of the day, um, used it against us. So, when I read Noam Chomsky's work, I was really impressed with how he laid out how you manufacture consent because it explained a lot to me in terms of my university education, in terms of what I was seeing in the media, in the news, all of these ideological institutions who were representing us. And I still found it to be dehumanizing. So if you look at current media coverage of any Native issue, they don't humanize us. You know, we're a problem and we're over here and we gotta be dealt with and we're very costly. So that's kind of the narrative that is still going on. And <clears throat> in order for Canada and the United States to find their freedom and their democracy by oppressing the people of this land, um, they had to manufacture consent to do that because how can you expose to the world you know, human rights and, and democracy when you basically founded that on people's blood um, there were massacres, there was um, uh, spreading of diseases, there was policies to make sure that we didn't make it. And that's really the point of this whole thing is I'm not supposed to be standing here today had these policies actually been effective. But we resisted and how we resisted was sustaining our own ideas and understanding of the world. Um, so at the end of the day, you come up with natural and inevitable development and, and we're not able to cope with it, so we kind of are at fault. We're weak, inferior, and unable to um, deal with development. But they don't talk about the actual policies that Canada had in place of assimilation. In 1924, um, Duncan Campbell Scott, stated to the House of Commons, I want to continue until there's not a single Indian left. And the United States, you had Ulysses Grant and others saying the plane had an extermination policy of wiping out Indians um, because they wanted the land and the resources. So people really don't know about these policies of extermination and other policies in the Indian Act were, which were legal. Um, if we look at the, how you think about this, um, Bandana Van, Shiva states, um, you know, colonial influence on biological and intellectual heritage of non-Western societies was devalued. And essentially, she goes on to explain how our knowledge becomes myth, it becomes unsubstantiated, and it becomes um, less than Western knowledge, which is supposed to be scientific and objective. But if you're an indigenous person, you know that that's not true. Um, it's very politically driven and it's about resources. So there's a lot that knowledge hierarchy um, then doesn't take into consideration the things that we have done. 
and these are unequal systems of power. So why don't you know the contributions Indigenous people made to shaping your life? Uh, the foods that you eat, what's available to you, the medicines. So those are things that you should learn, but they're not even available. So that has to tell you a lot about what's not there versus what is there. What is there is assimilation policies, and at this point they were um, able to take our children and put them into state institutions such as residential schools, um, or they were just taken out and adopted out. And the idea was to just get rid of the Indian. Um, they used missionaries to do this. It was illegal to do our ceremonies in residential school. If you spoke your language, you were beaten. Some had needles put through their tongues. There was a variety of horrors that went on in these schools to make sure that <clears throat> when you entered them, you did not practice your ceremonies, you did not practice your language. And you can imagine a five-year-old having to deal with this. At home on the reserve, and you know reserves are for animals, um, so that kind of tells you right in the discourse and the narrative and the language, like why do I live on a reserve? You need to think about those things, or why is Indian Affairs called Indian Affairs and Northern Development? You need to just think about the simple things that are right there in front of you. And it's really to strip us of our land um, and to take away our economic, spiritual, and political spheres of our society because we would pose a resistance to colonization. Our language is very important, um, largely because it has the intellectual legacy. We have ideas that cannot be expressed in English because English has connotations with its language. The easiest one I can use is women. Um, for many indigenous culture, just the term, the female, is a powerful entity. She is, she is a life giver. She is um, the land. She is movement, action, authority. You can't say woman in the English language and get that same connotation. So our language really does have our, 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 our ways of thinking about the world and constructing the world, which is everything is living, everything is alive. And I think now science is catching up to that. Um, for us, education, unlike most of the world, <clears throat> wasn't liberation. And I would say today we're just now starting to get out of that um, um, ability to use language to move, or use education to move forward. Um, but as um, Minister Scott thought, we need to just get the children and the people left at home um, obviously fell apart because if somebody came into your community and took all your children, I'm sure you would, you would not be happy. Um, thus, you have addictions. Um, and the children were then, you know, and this is well, well documented. Um, there's a ton of document. They documented very well what they did. Um, even though people came in, such as Dr. Price, that said, you know, you can't, you can't do this to these children. They're going to die. And his answer was, well, they'll die Christians. And I think just recently they've uncovered 3,000 graves at just one residential school. So the graves were not marked of all the children who died. We're still looking in that. Our education really was about social engineering. And what they wanted to do was destroy our culture. They outlawed our ceremonies in the Indian Act. Um, people went to jail for having Sundance ceremonies or potlatch, uh, spiritual leaders. Um, it, it was not a good time. And if we try to raise this issue in institutions such as universities, you know, there is a sense of epistemic violence um, and the idea that what we're saying is not true um, because you have thousands and thousands and thousands of docu documents that say everything that happened to us is because we're inferior biologically. So we can't really speak our truth as of yet <clears throat> and feel safe about it. Um, but the idea of social engineering um, is, you know, this. This was the idea. And these are the posters they would use to try to get um, people to donate to their schools, even though here in Brantford, where they went to school, um, it was, they were running farms. They were running businesses. 
the kids did the slave labor of creating lots and lots of produce and meat and so forth, but they had to eat mush every day. So in Brantford, it's called the mush hole. That's what our parents and grandparents remember because they weren't allowed to eat those apples or eggs or anything else. So they didn't have a very good relationship with education. Um, and that's been passed down. And then when you do get into the education system, you do begin to find that this is just reified in the institution um, about our immortality and virtues and, and that you know, we're lazy and so forth because we have a different concept of time and space. Um, and these classifications of representation are essentially the power of the dominating force. So, um, for example, and this is what I try to convey to people, as a Mohawk woman with five children, five grandchildren, it's very hard for me to have them learn their language. And I've stayed around here because we do have immersion schools that are not funded. They cut the funding. You can't find a Mohawk anywhere else in the world. So if you look at the world, and as a Canadian, somewhere you can trace your roots where those traditions, that language, the museums, the arts, the music continues on. And so coming to Canada and assimilating is fine if you want to. It's a choice. For us, as you can see, it was not a choice. It was forced, legal abduction of children. Um, and putting people on reserves and not allowing them to leave and so forth. We don't have an economy or we weren't allowed to, and we're still not allowed to borrow money. So I, as a professor, don't have the same rights as you to borrow money because our land is on a reserve and trust by the Crown. So that's why we're poor. So there's legal, legal bills within the Indian Act that ensure that we will stay impoverished. And um, people say, well, why don't you leave? And, and that is the idea is for us to leave. We're not going to leave. Um, and that's part of why we're trying to explain to people, you know, um, we are tied to this land and that's where our identity and that's where our spirituality flows from. So we don't wanna go anywhere else. We wanna stay here, but we don't run the museums. We don't, we don't have mainstream anything. We have to ask for money and do it in the way that they want us to do it. Now, move on to the lighter side of things is what I like, which is indigenous knowledge and research. This is known as the Gaswenta. We made this agreement as Iroquois people with the Dutch, later with the French and the British. And basically, the two rows are a political philosophy of self-government. And if you look at the terms and how the Gaswenta works, it matches equally with what the United Nations Declaration states now about self-government meaning we have two nations that will exist side by side and we won't try to steer the other person's boat. And while African countries have done well under the UN Declaration of um, Indigenous Peoples' Rights, Canada and the US has not. They haven't made any changes to give us any sense of self-government. In fact, it's getting worse. The contributions that we made to the world, and I just wanted to give you, uh, to end this um, talk, is this is information that's very hard to find. Very, very hard to find. If you want to do research on how many alcoholics there are, or how many of us are in prison, everywhere you look, you will be able to find that data. If you look for data that positions us in a discourse of of positivity, of resilience, of contributions, you're not gonna find anything. And again, that is a finding right there. Um, according to um, yeah, uh, United Nations um, work on this issue, 48% of the food in the Americas were domesticated by indigenous people. So essentially the cultivation of potatoes, maize, beans, all of these foods went all over the world. So the Irish potato is not because it's from Ireland, it's because it was our potatoes that saved them from the famine they were going through at the time. That's how it became known as the Irish potato. So we were basically giving all kinds of um, knowledge about how to grow 
all of these things in different climates and the seeds. Um, if you look at the nutritional value of the way we lived, um, most of our foods were in fact quite superior to the kinds of foods um, people are eating um, after contact. And that's why we have a lot of health issues is because we had such a great diet and now we have a, a pretty bad diet. We had architecture, um, urban planning. Um, if you go to uh, the Southwest, you'll see apartment buildings and they're mass. They're built together to keep uh, cool in the summer and, and, um, and hot in the winter. And these are the longest continued apartments in the Americas because the Hopi still live in them. So the idea of mass and urban planning comes from uh, a lot of Hopi architecture and Navajo. Um, medicines, hundreds of indigenous medicines are now in the pharmacopoeia. Um, but of course, they're not going to tell you where they came from. Um, the Rural Advancement Foundation finds that over 80% of the world's people depend on indigenous knowledge of health and security, and 50% rely on indigenous people for crops and food. So that's something to think about. Just take that one quote and think about it. You know, we have contributed enormously to the welfare and the, the, the health of the world based on our knowledges, not only of foods and agriculture, but also our medicines. Um, the, um, the idea of uh, intellectual property theft is why the United Nations is looking at it. But hundreds of indigenous medicines are now in the pharmacopoeia that produces over $43 billion. So things that came from indigenous people, like quinine, um, was then discovered by some colonizer, and then they took it and they benefited from that patent, whereas we never benefited from any of the knowledge that we shared. Um, 700 natural compounds used in uh, medicine for centuries is what most of, 25% of the American prescription drugs that are used today um, are derived from indigenous knowledge of plants. So the contributions we made to the world in medicine, food, engineering, the arts, architecture, political thought um, has yet to be really revealed and measured due to the lack of acknowledgement of the colonial constructions of the West. And that's where Chomsky even falls short because I asked him uh, when he spoke here, why did he look at South America? Why did he use his manufacturing consent of oppression for South America and not talk about North America? And I found that really interesting because again, his theories were so accurate in describing what happened to indigenous people in Canada and the US, but even he, who is considered you know, liberal, didn't cross that borderline. So he stayed in Guatemala and El Salvador to look at oppression rather than to look at Canada or the US. Barely much as indigenous people from here. So the narrative of the savage, the bows and arrows, the pottery shirts is kind of what we all grew up with and that we needed help to cope with modern uh, development is completely untrue. I mean, we saved a lot of the settlers from starving. Um, we fed them, we cured uh, the scurvy that they had and they all would have died. So they relied on our medicines and our knowledge for at least 200 years and they adopted it and then um, ignored where the intellectual contribution came from. So we're hoping in the next 100 years, people will take the idea of the discourse of what the Indian problem is and the myth of the white man's Indian and really truly look at the things that we've done that are incredibly um, great in the grand scheme of things. Um, and children should be learning that. So when they ask you, or when you ask about suicide, you need to put yourself in our shoes. If you're growing up in a country that is representing you as so inferior that you died of the common cold, I mean, these are the things you hear at school, in the media, in newspapers, and it, it bombards you. So it doesn't exactly encourage you or improve your self-esteem um, when your religious ways are considered 
barbaric and savage, and it was only in 1970s when they lifted the ban on our ceremonies. Um, that was very recent. So, um, you know, you're, you're kind of felt as if you're a deviant, you're, you're not a good human being, you have contributed nothing, um, and, and the West has had to save you from yourself. And then this is what they put out to the world. And what we're trying to do is change that, stop that cycle, that myth, and begin to start trying to tell the truth of what really happened um, to our people in this country. So I think we've, we're getting there. At least I'm here, and I have a PhD, and I didn't have to be tortured to get one. So that's a lot different than my grandmother. So yeah, I thank you. Thank you.